Oh, and, and look at that nice little uh, dragon emote there, too. Well, there you go. If y'all have dragons, you're welcome to post them in chat. Now, I wanted to... I wanted to get a little bit further into our conversation about setting. You might recall in our last setting workshop, we made some very basic elements of our map. And in fact, we created the geography of it, and even to an extent the topography of it, with beans and rice and a d20. I set this in the tray and I wiggled it around and wherever it landed, we had a volcano. Pardon me. After that, we had discussed how does weather work and how do we get water flowing over our land, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, I'll be revealing that up here in, uh, in just a moment. But we're going to go through some exercises now to take the, the very basic map that we have made and add a little bit more detail. And I'm going to want your all's help with that. This is going to be an interactive, uh, an interactive workshop where we're going to be able to roll some dice and we can make some... Uh, we can make some interesting settlements together. And I want to use this as a way to empower you to be able to quickly and meaningfully flesh out your settings. So let's take a look. Let's take a look here quickly at what is the concept of a setting. And for those of you out there, if you are if you're playing along at home, please do get your player's handbooks, your dungeon master's guides, and if there's any other sources of, of inspiration you'd like, you can go ahead and fetch them. And hey, if you don't have those books, please consider supporting your friendly local game store and picking a copy up, or even the three book gift set, which is a really good deal because it comes in a slip case. You get a, a, a dungeon master screen with it too. It's I may be biased, but it's a good deal. Setting. What is a setting? Setting is the time and place or when and where of the story. It's a literary element of literature used in novels, short stories, plays, films, etc. And usually introduced during the exposition, the beginning of the story, along with the characters. The setting may also include the environment of the story which can be made up of the physical location, climate, weather, or social and cultural surroundings. And this is, a, we are going to get into this. This is what we are going to, uh, to be establishing, and in a manner that I hope you don't find yourself either running into writer's block, or all your ideas uh, just pour out of your brain and scatter on the floor and they're gone forever. There are various ways that Time and place indicate setting. Time can cover many areas, such as the character's time of life, the time of day, time of year, time periods, such as the past, present, or future, etc. Place also covers a lot of areas, such as a certain building, and you can read this here. There are some examples for you here. You also have a uh, two types of settings. You have a backdrop setting. Have you ever read a story but found it difficult to figure out what the time period in which the story was written or where it is, the story probably had a backdrop setting. The story is timeless and can happen at any point in history or anywhere. The focus is on the lesson or message being delivered. Many fairy tales and children's stories have backdrop settings. Winnie the Pooh would be an example. Since the lessons that the characters learn is the point rather than the time period, it's hard to tack a past, present, or future on the time aspect of the setting. It could also be any town or country, which means children anywhere can relate to it. Or you have an uh, in, uh, integral setting. With an integral setting, integral means to be a part of or important to, the time and place are important to the story. 
For example, a story dealing with a historical setting will have a direct impact on the plot. A story that happens in the 1800s will not have technology. So the characters will have to write a letter, ride a horse, or take a carriage to visit each other. They cannot travel long distances in one day, as we do now with cars, buses, and planes. This will have a direct impact on the events of the story, especially if there is distance involved. Setting gives context to the character's actions in a storyline. It can also create the mood, how the reader or viewer feels. It's easier to understand why the characters in the story are doing what they're doing when we know where they are. The time of day, time of year, and ages of the characters will also affect how they act and what they say. And what have we already established, everyone out there in Chatland? We have already made our characters, we have set their ages, and we have their attitudes and the type of characters they are. If we do that first, knowing that they are products of the world in which they live, that is actually going to make it easier for us to create a setting. Because we have these uh, fixed extrapolations of it in the form of the villain, the hero, the mentor, and the, the two side support characters. And if we went on to make a bunch of extra, you know, the henchmen of the villain or, you know, a bunch of other NPCs, again, each of those characters are products of their environment, the setting. And if those characters exist, then so too do elements from which they came in the setting. And it, in my opinion and experience, it's a lot easier to develop a setting that way. Not just with a novel or some sort of writing in that regard, but let's pretend that you are a dungeon master and you are you want to plan a game and maybe you want to run an original setting or something along those lines. If your players hand you their character sheets, I think it's a safe presumption that they want to play that character. They, they are attached to the concepts presented in that character because they want to be the scrappy orphan. They want to be the... Uh, they, they want to be the uh, noble who wanted to just get out of being a noble for a while and go live among the countryside over which he presumably was supposed to rule. Uh, you know, the, the player wants to play a character that has these elements. And so that makes your job easier as the dungeon master and then kind of switching as the author into the world knowing the characters exist and what they do and how they function will make integrating them into the world a lot easier and make your world building both uh, active and passive world building be a lot easier and everything will also fit together more cleanly more cleanly instead of having something be jarring and maybe that's something you've noticed in a book or a comic or in a, a movie where there's a lot of things that seem to work, but one or two characters or aspects about them, or if, if not, the characters might all work together, but there's something about the setting that just seems so jarring. There's a big disconnect. You go, how is there a world like this that exists and also has people in it that function the way that they do? And you'll notice, even beyond my own soapbox lecture here on creating this stuff, if we go to sites like this, you're going to see that the setting is still tied to the characters. Don't have them be separate things. We are products of, by nature or nurture. We are still products of the world. And we there's a lot about our world that we can tell other people through our lives and our experiences to help give an angle, a description, to help give a consideration for others who might not be from our part of the world or from our circumstances in it. 
So, setting gives context to the character's actions in a storyline, and it sets the mood. You know, oh, you know, rainy days tend to have that, you know, kind of a suppressed feeling. Uh, or bright sunny days and the sky is crystal clear. You know, oh, the horizon of adventure is unlimited, and you go out into that world and, you know, you, you go get them. So, examples in here as well. Uh, things that you can, uh, things that you can reference, like, uh, settings in pop culture. One area of pop culture that relies heavily on strong settings is the video game industry. The YouTube video below illustrates the importance of setting in games. As computer technology has improved over the years, video games have progressed from boring, simple games to intense and complex gaming experiences, all due to the use of setting. Video games now have realistic backgrounds, whereas the first video games, as far back as the 50s, had blank or static, unchanging backgrounds. There are popular games designed in all time periods, past, present, and future, and in all areas of the world, including underwater and outer space, as well as fantasy worlds. A second example of setting within pop culture is Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. This is a novel that's been made into a successful series. Setting is a large basis of the story. The video below shows intro to the series, which starts out with a map of the kingdom, an indication that the setting will play an important part. So, more things for you to, you know, to look into on your own. Uh, things for you to... Broadly consider, but don't get hung up on it. You can begin a story by simply describing a tree on a hill. And then the story grows as if the tree on the hill is the axis upon which the entire rest of the world spins. In many cases, this is what you see in, in stories and video games. You know, look at Lord of the Rings. It starts in a very small rural town at the end of the, the Western world, right? And from there, it grows and grows in complexity, in vastness, in, in everything. So it's perfectly fine if you start your considerations and your storytellings and your campaigns with a single tree on a hill. And maybe that tree on a hill is based on something you experienced when you were a child. You had your favorite tree and there was a tire swing and, you know, dang it, if it wasn't a steel belt and it actually poked you time and again, uh, when the rubber started getting kind of thin and you go, ah, why, ah. Hi, Rip Artist. Good to see you. And Orca Twilight goes into lurk mode. Lurk well and lurk often, Orca Twilight. Thank you. When it comes to the setting, strong descriptions help readers create a good picture in their minds, and strong descriptive details will make the story more interesting. But setting can also be written into a story by using clues. Depending on the storyline and what aspect is most important, clues can be used to help guide the reader. Creating and writing settings is the same as using imagery. You are creating a picture for the readers by pulling on the senses, and this will help them understand the events of the story. So, decide on your storyline, what and who is the story about. Done? Ask yourself, where does the story take place? What are the physical characteristics? And we're going to be working on that a lot tonight. Example 1. The dog was limping. We have no idea why the dog was limping. What kind of dog? Is it young or old? Where is it? Now add details that give the time and place. The old black Labrador was limping as he climbed up the rocks, trying to keep up with his master. With added setting details, it's easy to see that the dog was limping because he was old, time, and he was in a rocky area outside, place. Because he's older and trying to keep up with his owner outside, he is tired out, which has caused him to have sore legs or feet. We can almost feel the dog's pain and visualize this loyal pet trying to keep up. Settings should be used whenever a story begins. 
Has a change in the events or readers need information to understand characters' actions. Setting is also used to create a mood, making the reader or viewer feel an emotion. Mystery stories may keep the setting hidden to keep readers guessing. Once the answer is revealed, the setting will be made clear. Clues of the setting might also guide readers to the answers. Scary stories use setting to create fear, mood, in the reader or viewer. In the beginning of the story, the exposition is used to set up the storyline or plot. This is the section that tells readers the two parts of the setting, where the story is taking place, what time period it is, and the characters in the story. The setting is vital to helping the reader understand what is happening and why. If the story changes location or time period, the setting must be described again so that readers can understand the next set of plot events. If you want the reader to feel a certain emotion, you need to use a lot of description to show the setting. Words, 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 words. Boring. Snooze fest. Checked out. TLDR. Too long. Didn't read. All right. Maybe it maybe it's not like that for you all. Hopefully it's not like that. Sometimes seeing things written out in this in this case uh, can, can, you know, get things activated for you upstairs. But why don't we actually do a fun little exercise with setting? And, uh, let's see. Camp Custom Designs, you are new, or newer to role-playing, am I correct? I'm calling you out in chat. Camp is like, <laughs> no, what did I do? <laughs> oui, on peut. Oui, on peut. All right, then. Hey, Dark Druid. Camp Custom Designs. I want to do some storytelling and some setting and setup with you. Are you willing? Do you have, do you have uh, a little bit, uh, en peu de temps, a little bit of time in order to help me out with this exercise? I'm going to call you up on stage. Oh, I was, I'm sorry. Camp, uh, camp custom designs. Oh, uh, well, I was saying howdy to you, Dark Druid. And all, by the way, Dark Druid and everyone out there, you can participate in this as well. I'm going to shine the spotlight on Camp Custom uh, for being newer to the hobby. All right. So let's pause our tabletop audio. All right. Camp Custom Designs. You just walked into a pub, an inn. I want you, through you and or a character you have in mind, I want you to tell me what is the first thing that you notice. Dun, dun, dun. And, and these can be short little answers. You don't need to write anything up that's terribly complex. My character would probably look around and notice a rowdy group of strangers at the bar and introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, so you, you're you looking at the, uh, at the bar, like maybe where the goblins are then. Unless you're, you're looking further away at the, uh, at the table in the foreground. In this instance, and now I used a picture, if you were writing a story, then from the 
from the point of view of the character... Yep, the goblins. Yep, goblins in your head. All right, so you would go and approach the goblins. Look at this. This is like a video game. Y'all are getting... You're getting interaction. Clop, clop, clop. Go your boots on the wooden floor. In this instance, if Camp is the one who is writing the novel or is uh, telling the story or is the DM, the environment... Pardon me. The environment could be described in a lot of ways. Though Camp is drawing attention to the rowdy goblins that are dancing on and around a table. And maybe we can hear the, the clip-clap scrape of the nails on the wood. And we can hear the roaring fire and the spitting embers and the hisses that indicate a fresh log uh, has been thrown in to keep things warm. Now, with this going on, if we have a fire lit in a bunch of candles, what are we indirectly saying? Now, we have directly stated what's going on. We have described a wooden floor, a wooden table. We have described the five goblins that are dancing and cavorting about. And, and we can develop the goblin direction here in just a moment, Camp. But I want you to tell me what are some passive elements of our setting that we have just established. Hmm. Think, think, think. It would, it would be implied that this is sometime in the evening. It could possibly even be a cold evening. But that's true. We've, we have developed a time, if not of day, it, only just of day. We might have even set a time of year where things are a lot more, uh, a lot more chilly. Now, camp, by simply describing the goblins, at least three of the goblins, dancing around with uh, with mugs of beer. What have we... Uh, oh, yeah, or underground. That Oh, that could be too, Miller. This could be a, a kind of a, a dwarven... Uh, a, a dwarven inn. Uh, or, you know, this is uh, sort of a, a break room in the mine shafts. That's, that's a very good point, Miller. I never even considered that. But camp, with me describing of the setting, a tavern, a pub, an inn, but specifically mugs, wooden mugs of beer, what have we just done to build out our setting? And if you're not sure or, you know, you're on the spot, just just say so, because all of this is going in particular directions. Uh, but I, I want your take, especially if it's a fresh take unprompted. Well, I'm, I'm glad we can stick out to you, Cosmic. OK, Rip, do what you got to do. All right, so Camp Custom. What I have uh, in telling you that the goblins, right? This is the first thing that you noticed, and I'll zoom in even closer. If the goblins can have wooden mugs of beer, this tells us that the world has carpenters, 
and especially if there's metal bands, there are miners and smiths and probably coopers to make barrels. Also, the beer is indicating that we're at a technology level where brewing has been discovered and at least refined to a particular point. This means in order to get our liquid bread, we need farmers and farm tools. We need domesticated animals for pulling the plows, uh, maybe even uh, you know uh, other, uh, other types of animals, uh, that there are roads of some variety in order to get the beer and the mugs here. And in the carpentry, it might even be advanced to a point that you can get finer details. Why, yes, Bane, you did. And so this, uh, while the wooden floor and the table is maybe basic level carpentry, the mugs might be slightly more advanced. And while you didn't point it out, uh, Camp Custom, if we were to zoom out a little bit from here, we see that woodworking actually has a little bit more advancement than just simple construction. And we can ask ourselves, was the beer made in a brewery? And if so, was the brewery a business? Or was the brewery something like a monastery, a religious order? Could this statue be a product of that as well? Also, Camp Custom, you know, obviously there, there would be trees for the logs and the fire, but if we were describing all the candles, which was an, in, uh, an indication of, uh, if we we're uh, describing that, I'm sorry, as an indication of the time of day or the lighting conditions, we need to have chandlers to make the candles. This might mean that we have people who raise bees for the wax or that we're getting tallow from butchers and that we're burning, uh, we're burning fat as candles. And what we have done by simply having you as whatever character you're playing walk in through the door, we have built in an entire economy with perhaps religion and other aspects of a world. Roads, where people live, what people favor and how they spend their time. About to put in earplugs so I don't hear all the snoring. Oh, are, are you, uh, you're, uh, hold up with a couple people? I hope that you're having a good vacation, Bane. Back, neighbor locked herself out. Good thing she, oh, then that was very nice that you were able to help your neighbor out, Rip. Uh, and I'm sorry, Camp, I missed what you said there. Uh, gotcha. I thought that's what you mean, but overthought it. Uh, the city has been developed. Yep. Yeah, you're still on vacation till Sunday. All right. Well, then, Bane, don't don't let me don't let me detract from that. But we can see. So we start we start small. We start with just some goblins dancing at a table in an inn. Simple. A lot of us can imagine it. And with this one scene, with this one scene, in just describing the goblins just describing the fire and the candles we have built uh we have built fundamental parts of our setting and we've established mood we've established time and we might even be establishing place and in fact maybe going into um uh might be going into a little bit of what miller talked about because let's expand our world a little bit, okay? Let's expand our world from the very first thing that caught our eye. Well, we did talk about this statue. But maybe even more importantly, and by the way, we must have smiths. Because we have some metal chains holding up the, uh, the chandeliers here. So there's a religious order. That looks like uh, maybe it offers protection, or it's a uh, maybe it's a god of war, or something. Maybe this is actually strength, and and so we understand more about the society. But let's take a look here. If what might make this an underground inn? We shift our focus. It looks like we might have a drow and a duragar 
sitting at the bar. And a Duragar is the one pouring the drink for the drow. Now, in just doing this, what else have we established about our world? Not only do we have smiths, we have glass blowers, and we don't have just simple barrels of ale. We have all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, wines or spirits. And we're getting fine glass bottles and even fine glass cups, if you look here in the center. And as we're describing the scene, they must be laughing about something. It makes the imagination, you know, it makes the imagination go. Camp. So camp custom designs. You're, you as your character walk in. You see the goblins. That, that was the first thing. Yep. Hey, be well, Bane. Thank you for stopping by and hanging out. I hope you can get some sleep. Your attention is drawn to the bar, because you, you had talked about the bar as well. Because you said the rowdiness by the bar. Camp Custom Designs, what are they talking about? Oh, what's that, Dark Druid? Yeah, what, what is this sleep thing? is thinking what what are they talking about hmm there is they could be joking about the goblins or it looks kind of flirty well camp you have to describe this story to us you are you are the author and or our dungeon master yep i'm asking you what is your what is your interpretation uh as as dm author or if you want to play as a character because in in that case your character is the filter for us to experience the world in which your character exists. So we need to experience the world, this fantasy world, through your character's eyes, ears, etc. And so you tell me, what's uh, what are they talking about or what's happening here? And it could just be a quick thought. You know, you could just rapid fire some stuff out. What is what is your, your gut feeling? What's the first impression that you get? They're going to be seemingly flirting, and she could be prying for information about what's going on around town. Ah, right? You asked because you asked the, the bartender. No, I, I got you, Camp. It, it's fine. I appreciate you playing along. Okay, excellent. So... Your character kind of goes, oh, whoa, what's this? And uh, you hear some something flirty happening. And you are you are now going to get, from what Camp just said in that one sentence, you now have a device through which you can inform the audience that there is a town outside of this scene and possibly what is going on in that town. And that could back up the fact that there are farm fields and breweries, there's monasteries and glassblowers, smiths and carpenters, and coopers and chandlers and butchers, etc. To back Joe, hello and welcome. Thank you very much for the follow. And so we can also hear, what if they're talking about sports? Ah, so now there's some sort of a, a sports ball team or field or if not you can get little hints of political intrigue and so not only do we hear about the town but then you hear i don't know well i you know the king's guard is in town all the way from the capital yes all the way from the capital over the the far hills 
now we're doing world building. And it's all out of this setting. Yeah, Tabak Joe, thank you for finding us and joining us as we're going through this writing exercise. So our setting continues. In fact, what if something is dropped that could give us a hint of... Uh, oh, you know, did you hear uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, old man Qualish is almost done with his invention? What, that rusty old bucket of things? Yeah, that's the thing. I heard that it's going through some, some testing right now. You know, of everything that it could look like, why a lobster? Now, stop right there. What do we get from that? There is mad science or alchemy. There might possibly be magic. We get a sense that if if, if the, uh, the drow candidly knew what a lobster was, we are probably close enough to a, a coast that she uh, has seen lobsters or eats uh, seafood or lobster and uh, has an opinion about them and can juxtapose that against the invention of whoever this old man Qualish is. And that there's not just blacksmiths, but there are there are tinkerers and other magicians doing amazing things. This might also put us in the time period of the old ironclads. You know, for us, uh, for us in the U.S. around the time of the Civil War, where we had ironclad ships and the very first uh, styles of submarine. If we're getting an apparatus of Qualish. Now, that is a direct D&D reference. If you're not sure what an apparatus of Qualish is, uh, go check it out. And what I said will make a lot more sense. However, if it didn't, because this is a foreign notion to you, what did me talking about in that introduction bring up? Imagery. It kept you wondering, a lobster tank? What the heck? Oh, whoa, what's this? I want to read more. I want to know more what's going on. All right, camp camp custom designs. What's going on? Because after your character uh, is done doing a little bit of mischievous eavesdropping at the bar, you can't help but notice the other figure sitting by the bar. She appears to be alone. Hey, Raven, oh, you're home now. Well, welcome home. She appears to be alone. What what's happening here? It, it, in describing this character what could this indicate and by the way I do want to bring up as well with the things that we've described if you are if you're using a couple extra extra adjectives we clearly have leather workers. And we also have, uh, let's see, we have, uh, well, there, there's been no haberdashery just yet. We have leather workers. We definitely have tailors. We have dye manufacturers because we have a very, you know, in, in sort of a, a dull environment, we have a bright green and a bright red. So we might have uh, dye makers and various uh, clothiers. We must have trappers and hunters and others, uh, you know, tanners and leather workers. And if we look here and we describe this character, we look at the character, how can we use this as a way to enhance our setting? Yep, Stella. Yep, glass blowing for sure. Which, of course, indicates that they need a way to make very hot fire, uh, that they have the tools, the specialty tools to make it, and even the various uh, powders or tints that could go into making higher quality... Uh, higher quality glasswork. And Ghost Swarm 86, hello, welcome to you. Thank you for uh, for joining us again. I got to make sure I give Camp a, a little bit of extra time here to to uh, take a look. And by the way, Raven, now that you're home, we're going to be going through the setting uh, worksheet in a little bit. So, of course, I'll be looking for people to help roll some dice for that. Probably expecting someone who hasn't appeared yet and maybe enjoying the food. What kind of food is this, uh, Camp? 
Let, let me see if I can make it bigger for you because you are on a mobile device. Stella thinks the high heel on the woman sitting at the bar is a bit suspect. Looks like meat, maybe chicken with an arrangement of spices or sides. Aha! And if all we do, Camp, or in this case, if all you do as the author or dungeon master say that a woman sits at a table expect looking expectant for someone else and is eating chicken, well, now we have... Uh, now we have farmers who don't only really just make uh, uh, raise cattle for leather or you know other such animals. This would also imply that there's eggs, that we have chicken, or you know some sort of a similar animal, and you just said spices or sides, things like sauces. This is going to now build more because all we know is there's got to be trees for the wood and some sort of grain for the beer. Well, now you're doing a little bit more world building because you're indicating that there are spices. And if you as the author or DM were to say something like exotic spices, what that is indicating is that these are spices that are not from this area. Now you're indicating that there is a larger world. Yeah, ah, oh, camp, you got it. It could indicate there's overseas trading or influence depending on the spices. Yes, absolutely, absolument, absolument. This could also be reinforcement. Look, look at the spices. Look at the dye that was used for the cloth or leather of the pants and the, um, and the top. There could be a connection here as well, or this is talking about trade, international trade, foreign trade. And in this description, now not only do we have the inn, not only do we have the town, we know there's a kingdom over some hills, and that there's spices from even beyond the faraway kingdom. And if you're describing, uh, if you're describing the spices, as exotic to this land. But the exotic spices are actually to us more maybe savory or it'd be something more like bay leaves or rosemary. That is indicating that the people who live here actually might eat uh, like chili peppers very commonly. That the common taste, the common cuisine is actually hot, 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 hot. Or everyone loves mint in everything here. Everything has mint. The liquors have mint. The savory dishes have mint. The desserts have mint. I don't know. But you can use the spices as a spice to passively describe our setting and the tastes of the people who are here. Why are there no burn marks on the table with those little candle holders? Asks Stella. They, they, yeah, so there we go. Camp Custom told you they're magic tables. And why are they magic tables? Well, for a reason. People made them to be magic tables. They could have been They could have been freshly clean. They, there's a hundred things that could possibly describe it. It could be a brand new table that hasn't, uh, that hasn't been scuffed or burnt yet. And if that's the case, if there's a brand new table here, but we know that there's other scuffed up old tables elsewhere, that might indicate... Because you see how uh, you see how over here, it's uh, it's kind of burnt. That might indicate that this is a new table. And if this is a new table, could it possibly be that this place gets rowdy time and again? We're doing a lot. We're doing a lot of passive storytelling. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, right? Uh, see, there, there's Coopers, there's Chandlers, 
There's religious orders. There's definitely masons and glass blowers. And now, why don't we go and take a look as we come back over. Speaking of tables. About what could be going on. Oh, Miller saying enchanted with prestidigitation that occurs. Now, if that's the case, that might indicate that cantrips in this world might be more common or they've hired a specialist that has prestidigitation. It's still world building as we ask and answer these questions. All right, Ghost Swarm, reboot and we'll see you back here. Um, Dark Druid says the door to the tavern creaks open and a shadow falls into the open room as a familiar presence stoops low, allowing his seven foot six frame to duck the door's header. Dorlon, the dragonborn constable, imposes himself upon the screen, looking around with keen pupils, emerald eyes, landing his gaze on Raylan. Uh, Raylan, the drow seated on the bar. You sent word I might find someone we've been looking for? So, there you go. Dark Druid has provided you all an, a very excellent prompt and an extra bit of world building. The elderly elven woman is obviously well-to-do, or she knows the owner to sit at the new table, says Stella. Now, camp, we can see here, it looks like there's some similar, uh, some similar food and spices. So this might be a more common dish. And as if you were to describe this, now there's a scene that is going on that Dark Druid, uh, and I, I narrated it, but Dark Druid had provided in chat just a little bit above. What might be a, a little bit of world building, some setting that this part of the picture can instill? Maybe you describe one or two things actively and what are one or two things that are passively made of in your setting that describe mood or time. Mood, time, or place. And there is, uh, just so you know, there is no one correct answer for this camp. This is from your observation and this is from your instinct as a storyteller or through the character you are piloting to give us these descriptions. Because remember, as an author, yeah, you're the one writing the story, though you're sort of hobbling yourself as the know-it-all god of the book because you can only describe what's going on through the character. Uh, Dark Druid, uh, that there may not be a dominant, uh, yeah, there may not be a, a, a dominant or a predominant uh, racial composition here. Yeah, it's very diverse. Because look, we have... Uh, of course, th there's always the hooded, uh, mysterious uh, person in the corner. Presumably human, but who knows. We have another human, presumably, could be Elven. We're not sure yet, as the helmet hasn't come off, but very humanoid. There's maybe a gnome or a halfling as well. I'm going to say it seems to be pretty lively, so maybe not an area divested by disaster or heavily impacted by war. Seems like races are pretty friendly across each other as well. All right, campus. A campus. Camp custom. <laughs> Stella says, my observation leads me to check my silver pouch. A lot going on. And distractions always lead to theft. Ooh. There you go, Stella. Don't mind the hooded person. They're just the DM. <laughs> Shush, you. And and what DM would ever have the initials MM? That is that is unrelated and unreliable. It is, uh, it, it is terrible to even consider. So yeah, things are probably pretty good, uh, right, Custom? Look, there's bread in solid and liquid form. There's pieces of meat in a full poultry of some variety. 
Um, it looks like everyone seems to be having a pretty good time. Uh, so there's probably not rationing or a famine or some sort of uh, very hostile environment going on. And you didn't even really have to go out of your way to describe that. You showed you didn't tell. You showed people having a good time in the way that you presented them. Therefore, there's a lot that we can read beyond that. And this is a big part of writing, especially with setting. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. If you have to tell someone, it means that it, like, it's not obvious. It's not common knowledge. Really, 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 my initials are DLM, so technically I could be considered the dungeon lore master. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Dark Druid, so those people are playing D&D. &D. Uh, there's that, diverse community. Don't mind the hooded person. That red dragonborn looks kind of sketchy. And so Dark Druid also provided uh, that there are other draconic people, right? The Dragonborn Constable. So there is an, a sense of law that's here. And there's even a relationship between the proposed Constable and um, uh, p uh, Keen Pupilless Emerald Eyes, uh, landing his gaze on Raylan the Drow. So uh, he even was able to give uh, some details about what's going on here. So while the action is taking place here now, uh, what happened? All right, so we were over here. Then we described, or Dark Druid described, a scene happening here, entering, do, 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 entering the inn, and the constable goes off here. You know that something's happening and, and is under control here, and our attention is drawn here, while other things are happening around us. This is another big part of establishing your setting. Make sure that your audience, whether they're your players or your readers, know that there is always more going on in the world. That they could always shift their attention elsewhere and there is somebody or something that they can explore elsewhere. It's just always, uh, it's always on the horizon or it's in the peripheral vision. So now we know there's action happening, you know, way over here, but our attention is drawn as things are happening. We're showing, not necessarily telling. We're letting our audience think about these things because if they think about it, they can get invested into the story we're presenting by filling in the purposeful gaps with things that are meaningful to them. What's the cat looking at? Asks uh, Stella. Hmm. Bell the cat has noticed some uh, some memories. It would appear, and uh, and so this is something else. If we if we go off of what uh, Dark Druid had said about the Dragonborn having emerald pupilless eyes, and maybe this indicates that the Dragonborn of this world are a lot more reptilian. Well, let's take a look. Because Bell the Cat has noticed that for a reptile, this reptile not only has pupils, but also has memories, right? Boobs. What is this indicating about the setting and the people? Or do we have an exceptional figure here? Is she different than the uh, very boldly presented... Uh, form of the Dragonborn Constable who does not have pupils. What could make her different? It could even be wings. Because uh, while Dark Druid described that Dragonborn as being very tall and imposing, he didn't describe wings. So clearly these are actually just, uh, uh, you know, large pectoral muscles for flying with the wings. But we also see we have another character 
We have another character here who is animalistic compared to, you know, the, the standard humanoid like a, a, a human or an elf. Not slitted pupils, round pupils, feathers instead of scales, also has wings. Very interesting. Though, uh, Camp, given the discussion so far, and I promise I'll take you out of the hot seat soon. You've looked around. They're obviously having a conversation. Something spilled. Something happened. You know, oh, you know, what, what's going on here? And we, we take a look. Oh, there's the barmaid. And, uh, oh, well, that explains that. But as you're getting more comfortable, because you have you have gone from an environment in which you knew nothing, and so your body is in a fight or flight mode, you need to look for important clues quickly to make judgment calls. But now that you've looked around, there's a, there's a, a law, uh, a, you know, an enforcer that's here, someone to keep the law, this place is warm, it's well kept, and while there's uh, even something kind of silly going on here, uh, with a little bit of laughter and fun, now your eyes can go from that, that tree on a hill, that singular focus that's easy to understand. You need the immediate information. What's the most notable information? You locked in on it. The goblins were the first thing that caught your attention because of danger or interest or opportunity of some variety. And so now you look around and we follow the action. Boop, 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 boop. Oh. This wasn't described initially, Camp Custom. Here, I'm gonna go back to it. I wanna zoom in a little bit more. This wasn't described initially, but now you as the author after you've established the scene and the setting and you've given plenty of clues for the audience to also feel more comfortable. Now that you've seen what you've seen, what does this mean to you? What kind of... Uh, what kind of... direct or indirect world building have you just done by describing what you see here? Dark Druid says, Hippogriff and Passant Rampant. Rampant. Although I think that you're not supposed to pronounce the T at the end. Hippogriff and Passant Rampant. So Bell the Cat says, it's a two-headed dragon hippogriff. Yep. So we see that there's at least a notion or a concept of these kinds of creatures that exist. It could be fantasy, it could be reality, though weren't we just introduced to something similar? Sorry, I switched between PC and phone. I missed half of that with the delay. Uh, all right, so Camp, from everything that we've seen so far, you have the luxury now of focusing on things that maybe weren't as, uh, as much a threat, a menace, or an opportunity, or something inherently interesting. And so, the description from you as the author or the DM through the character you're running indicates that you notice across the inn a, a plaque or a placard. Given everything that we have seen so far, what does this do for you that is either direct or indirect world building? Also a magic eye to keep an eye out for thieves and there do well. Oh, Belle, you noticed. Belle the cat has seen it. Uh, and also gives a conjecture as to what it does. 
Dark Druid Productions says, I could build a few weeks games on this image and I love it. I'm very glad. So this is the core image here. And then let's do a little zoom out, okay? What might we pick up? I mean, the banner plaque could have a local guild. And I was going to comment on the eye being there for security or spying, but they beat me to it. Hey, that's fine. Hive mind is absolutely okay. What could we be very uh, indirectly implying if there is this, this placard, this coat of arms? And didn't we also just describe... A red dragon and a black griffin. If all you did was describe these characters first, then in scanning around, you made a note of this placard. You don't have to tell anything to your audience. What could you be heavily implying? by indicating there is a prominent coat of arms in this place. Ah, Dark Druid says one might notice if one were inclined or rolled high enough <laughs> that the heraldic plaque on the wall matches the coat of arms on the shield strapped to Dorlon's back. And that is hearkening back to the prompt before where Dorlon was the seven foot six dragonborn uh, constable. The elder elven woman at the table placed the all-seeing eye at the table and is watching all the actions from comfort and privacy. Ah, so Stella is thinking that this is actually uh, she's security. Right? She's out of the way. She's behind She's behind this uh, this uh, pillar and this carving, and she might actually be the one who is working security and keeping an eye on everyone from the eye up here. Bell the Cat is thinking that the Dragonborn and the Aarakocra are the owners. Now, from all that's been discussed, I want to do one last thing for this segment before I get up and take a, a little walk and a break. Everything that was explored and discussed, and by the way, Camp, if you're still, if you're typing something, that's fine. The crest on the shield will change and much in its occupants is a mirror. Ooh. Everything that we've just described has been here the entire time. It's all been here for you all to see and absorb. But what we did as an author, as a DM, as a creator, is we guided, we guided the attention of our audience and we built the story actively and passively 
by putting a focus on one thing at a time. And the entire the entire exercise has made a loop around. Because now that you've been made individually aware of various elements, now you can take it in and think about it. But it all started with supposedly a stranger, Camp Custom Designs, walking, uh, you know, it, it's apparently dark out, right? Camp walks into the door, da ding da ding, and is hit with the warmth and the laughter and everything. The first thing Camp through the character needs to do is make sure, like, a dagger's not flying at your face, or someone's not pulling a gun, or a laser beam. Oh, each of those indicate other parts of the setting. Cool, we're safe. Uh, it looks like there might have been an accident or something, but the goblins were the first thing to be described. Then the bar. Then the person by the bar. Then uh, the, we go past the statue to the table, uh, more in the foreground. And then we finish up with the plaque, which was front... Uh, I mean, it wasn't like front, but it was in the middle, right there, the whole time. But that was not the first thing noticed but that could end up being actually the most important clue about this place. Who owns it, who runs it, who controls it, and who ultimately has the information. And it was there the whole time. But if you as the author or, or DM just describe everything at once in a text dump, the reader is not going to know what to focus on or what to do. It's noise. And just like we do when we walk into new places, we need to do a threat or an opportunity assessment. I've never been here. What's going on here? Am I going to die here or can I get a need met here? And once we have the original fight or flight panic suppressed, by realizing that we're not going to have harm come to us, then we can look around, we can enjoy the detail of things, we can enjoy uh, wondering about where everything came from, what, uh, why are things the way that they are. This place was purposely built like this for a reason, with uh, economics, available resources, uh, current aesthetics for the time, taken into consideration it's been implied it's been directly stated through camp custom designs that the one table is a magic table and then there's an implication that there are other uh more esoteric magics than something practical like a spell to keep your table clean all the time by the eye up above in the rafters of the inn that's rather clandestinely hidden so hopefully you all enjoyed this, and I'm going to leave you on another fun little uh, little screen where maybe you could find adventure or a story. Let's go over to the workshop break screen, have fun looking around, enjoying what's here. Hey, Art Hard Studios! I'm I'm just getting I'm gonna get up, take like a five minute break, and then I'll be back for an exercise where I'm going to need your all's help in order to build a setting for our NaNoWriMo novel. So Art Hard and others, stick around, and then let's build our setting together in the next part. I'll see you soon.